Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Max Paul Friedman. I'm interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, thank you for joining us today for the installation of the inaugural Trone Family Eminent Scholar Chair in Neuroscience and Behavior. We are grateful to have so many of the university's senior leadership joining us. In particular, I would like to recognize President Sylvia M. Burwell, Provost Peter Starr, the Board of Trustees members, Mark Duber, Gina Adams, Jack Cassell, Pamela Deesh, Tom and Bobby Gottschalk, Mehdi Haravi, and faculty representative, John Haywood. I uh, would like to welcome the members of the President's Cabinet and my fellow deans. I'd also like to recognize some very special guests. Marnie Abramson and her niece, Alexandra, are here representing Board of Trustees member Gary Abramson and his wife, Penny Abramson, for whom this Discovery Hall is named. Marnie is the Abramson's daughter and an AU alumna. We're so pleased that she and Alexandra are with us today. Through the Abramson's generosity, we're able to be together in this magnificent space in order to recognize one of our leading researchers. It is only fitting that today this room provides a gathering place to honor the generation of knowledge and innovation at the highest level. Thank you to Gary, Penny, and family for helping to create spaces that foster discovery and connect people and ideas within our community and beyond. We are honored that the College of Arts and Sciences is home to the Trone Family Eminent Scholar Chair in Neuroscience and Behavior, endowed by Board of Trustees member Congressman David Trone and his wife, June, through the David and June Trone Family Foundation. We're delighted that David Trone is here with us today. We're grateful to the Trones for endowing this eminent scholar chair to lead AU's cross-disciplinary and path-breaking work in behavioral neuroscience. This distinguished position will help advance solutions to addiction, grow AU's capacity to apply our uniquely collaborative approach to other related disorders, and solidify AU's growing reputation for socially consequential scientific discoveries. Today, we will install one of the field's leaders, Dr. Terry Davidson, as the inaugural Trone Family Eminent Scholar Chair in Neuroscience and Behavior. As a distinguished professor of neuroscience, chair of AU's Department of Neuroscience, and director of AU's Center for Neuroscience and Behavior, Dr. Davidson is leading groundbreaking research that is poised to transform our understanding of addiction and other cognitive disorders. His team's cross-disciplinary research on the influence of diet on an individual's susceptibility to addiction links both drug abuse and overeating to impairments in cognitive rather than motivational control. This path-breaking research marks a fundamental shift in traditional approaches to addiction. Dr. Davidson is an example of a true changemaker in action. The work of Dr. Davidson and his team presents an extraordinary opportunity to address a root cause of drug abuse and other cognitive disorders, which will pave the way for more effective treatments and policy developments. His groundbreaking discoveries hold promise for transforming how society addresses some of its most destructive health crises. AU has a rich history of generating research that has a tangible impact on our world. Our commitment to this type of change-making scholarly work is an integral part of the Change Makers for a Changing World strategic plan led by Pre President Sylvia Burwell. Under President Burwell's leadership, AU has also launched Change Can't Wait, the Campaign for American Universities, which supports and advances the Change Makers plan and research that makes a difference. The Trone Family Eminent Scholar Chair is part of this historic effort and a reflection of the university's capacity for scientific discovery. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome to the podium the president of American University, Sylvia Burwell. Thank you very much, Dean Friedman, and Congressman Trone, and our colleagues and friends who join us all today. There's a bit of a paradox, actually, about being an agent of change, a change maker. Each of us individually wants to make a difference in the world, sometimes a very big difference, 
But what we quickly discover is that almost nothing of consequence, especially even in this town, is achieved in isolation. It takes family, it takes friends, it takes colleagues, programs, and institutions. Some people learn that lesson too late. Others like David know it instinctively and they live it. And so when we opened this conversation, uh, David, about creating the Trone Family Eminent Chair, David immediately understood, and maybe even better than all of us uh, with all of his different experiences, the full implications of this gift. Endowed faculty chairs provide continuity and vision for our research. They provide an anchor of expertise that helps us retain great talent. They're vital to our ability to attract creative minds, both students and faculty. And they ensure that our partnerships across disciplines are collaborative in both practice and in spirit. If ever there were a topic deserving of this approach, it is of course neuroscience. It gives us a window into the human condition, a frame for understanding the lives of individuals and societies in the time ahead. And just as importantly, it creates a window of opportunity to be more humane right now, to help those who suffer with or wrestle with addiction, contend with dementia, or even mood disorders. Ultimately, this act of generosity will help improve the quality of countless lives, and in some cases will even save lives. And as the Trone family knows so well, it will have an immediate impact on our strategy to excel in learning, to inform our scholarship and vision, and to better our community and our nation. David is an extraordinarily gifted businessman. He has created scores of jobs across the country and jobs that hold families together, jobs that put children through college, and some would have stopped there in terms of their contributions. But David brought his intellect and his energy to the Congress to deliberate on, to decide on the great questions of our time and with David Trone to move legislation and change that helps our country. Some might have stopped there, but not David. So together he and Joan have set a higher goal and they committed themselves to a lifetime of high purpose and broad generosity. And you can see that in the breadth and depth of what they do and the support they give for so many causes, ones that will benefit generations yet to come. So today we thank David and June Trone. We're overjoyed that they are such strong and inspiring friends of American University. This ceremony marks the momentum that AU changemakers have because we have accepted the challenge and we know that change cannot wait. With that, David, I welcome you to the podium. Sure, I'm gonna forget my mask too. <laughs> it's the way it usually, way it usually goes. Uh, first of all, I wanna say, uh, Sylvia, of course, thank you, of course, but June uh, sends her regards uh, she would love to have been here today. She's in Los Angeles, and uh, just too much of a, a short commute. <laughs> but um, but uh, I also want to uh, say it's wonderful to be here today in the uh, Penny and Gary Abramson Discovery Hall. I mean, the, the leadership of the Abramson family, I've served with Gary and uh, on the board and watched his leadership there as he's run the board and driven this school to new heights and you know, Penny's been a, a great friend of ours, and we work on lots of causes together side by side, and it's wonderful to have Marnie here and your niece with you, so thank you uh, for all you guys do. I mean, thank you so much. I also want to thank uh, Sylvia, because we, again, she's helped me so much and so many times in Congress, and I call on her and say, hey, you know, what do you think we should do about this or that? And she's connected me with so many folks on the other side of the aisle in particular. You know, my whole goal is moving Senate Republicans. If I can get Senate Republicans, I can do anything. It's all that matters. And to do that, you know, you need someone from West Virginia. <laughs> and, 
I, I will say, Sylvia, we got 1.25 billion in the bill uh, in the infrastructure bill. Where I was that guy, Joe Manchin's house partner, <laughs> and he was a good dance partner to have. <laughs> so that bill went right through, and uh, a lot of that went right to your state. Who would have guessed? <laughs> Who would have guessed? <laughs> but my state's good. Where well, I'm on the Appropriations Committee now. I'm also in the subcommittee for transportation. So we did okay in Maryland. We'll finish our roads without much problem. I also want to thank Dean, uh, Dean Friedman uh, for all your work and what you've done here in this height of the pandemic and all the challenges you know, that are here. It's just, uh, has to be mind boggling. I know in my business, I felt that as we, you know, we work across the country, I operate in 27 states. We got like 12,000 employees. So. I know what's happened with the pandemic and supply chain shortages. And I mean, for you guys to be able to continue to, to roll like you have and, you know, God bless you. And uh, thanks for all that hard work. And really it's just a, a generation of leadership and that's the real key. And that's why we're honored today to recognize uh, the investiture of the Trone Eminent Scholar Chair in Neuroscience and Behavior. So a heartfelt congratulations to Dr. Terry Davidson. It's great to see the family here to come out from Indiana. And I've already recruited them to be customers in Indianapolis. <laughs> Gave them the address. Um, all joking aside, I did do that. Uh, uh, the big challenge uh, really in Congress is to get folks thinking about addiction, you know, differently. Addiction is not a moral failing. We all know that. It's just patently false. Terry's work on brain research and the, the root causes of addiction and cognitive disorders will help break that stigma that holds us back on true movement and legislation on addiction and mental health. Maybe in our lifetimes, we'll see addiction for what it is, a really serious illness and not a human weakness. For these reasons and many others, yeah, I couldn't be happier uh, that Terry is the inaugural chair. So thank you, sir, so much. The research at AU's Center for Neuroscience and Behavior has that potential to transform the way we address addiction and mental health throughout our country. We need it after COVID now more than ever. We can see that COVID has led to two more pandemics. Mental health in America has just skyrocketed the mental health challenges. It's unbelievable what's happened. It used to be 11% was the number people felt depression or anxiety in a 30 day period. That number went up to 37%. All of us, rightly so, myself included, are nervous and should be. So we really need help in these areas now more than ever. The good news is Congress is starting to realize this is more than a problem afflicting some. It's an epidemic afflicting, afflicting all. And we're finally beginning to move the needle on this issue. However, before we can create effective policies, we need that research. We need science, science. That's what America has been dropping the ball on science to back it up. That's why investments in neuroscience and behavioral research are so critical. When I decided to run for Congress, I looked upon it as an extension of really my philanthropic efforts. June and I said, we're gonna cost a lot of money to run campaigns. It's not deductible. So I look at it as a philanthropic, non-tax deductible expense. <laughs> so all you do is say, when you make a donation, usually it's 50%. And this one, it's 100%. But you know what? It is so worth it. Because if we can continue to move as we build our way up the food chain through appropriations and connecting with all other members, have a fundraiser with Nancy on Thursday morning, 8 a.m. for all the frontliners. We're writing a check there for over 500,000 just to help those frontliners because we wanna keep coming back in the majority. And we've gotta keep coming back. So we're working with the Senate and the Democratic side also in a huge way with Chuck. So 
we look upon this as a way I can make a difference in addiction, mental health, criminal justice. I've worked with the ACLU for 20 some years and medical research. Those are the four areas I focus on in Congress. We have one of the most driven, focused offices uh, imaginable. And now we have an opportunity to literally move billions of dollars. So it's no longer donating 10 million, 20 million, whatever it might be, it's billions of dollars to help Americans struggling with mental health, addiction, and drive medical research. It's only a billion in Congress. They don't even hardly count that. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. That starts addressing one of the biggest problems we're facing now, the declining mental health we touched on. And I'm sure you know it's a major problem on college campuses. We recently introduced the Higher Education Mental Health Act so we can learn the best ways of young people that are suffering from mental illness. 75% of mental illness conditions begin before the age of 24. The average time before they're addressed it's 11 years. Those are pretty bleak statistics. We can do better. We have to do better. We can help our students right here. And that helping them here in the beginning of their time ensures they'll stay on track and graduate on time and go to live the lives that they all deserve. This bill will establish a national commission studying mental health with college students. With research, we can move the needle, break the stigma. This position in this university helps us do that. But mental health isn't our only big problem, it's addiction. Addiction's been personal to me. I lost a nephew, he was 24. He died of a fentanyl overdose, alone in a hotel room. And last year we lost over one 100,000 people now. Trailing 12 month, the number just went out at 100 plus thousand people from overdoses. 90% of those are fentanyl. Fentanyl is the issue. I just came back from Mexico City where I'm co-chairman with Tom Cotton on the commission to stop synthetic opioids coming into the US. The answer is not gonna be stopping supply. We have a lot of good ideas there. We have great people in Customs and Border Patrol, but Mexico is controlled by the cartels. End of story. Their gross domestic product is estimated to approach 400 billion of the 1.2 trillion in the Mexico GDP, one third of the whole country. They have a simple po policy now in Mexico, hugs, not guns, which means they're arresting no cartel members above mid-level, nobody, zero. They decided they don't, can't deal with the guns, the chaos. So it's a system that we're not gonna stop supply. So then it comes down to Terry, and it comes down to our folks at NIH that we have to stop demand. So our commission will come up with a lot of ideas on supply and demand. We'll issue that report next February. And we're working with President Biden, I was at the White House today, for a bill signing on veterans and veterans that we got today on mental health with veterans, our women vets in particular. And we're gonna be pushing from the White House all the way down to drive addiction and mental health together as a joint effort. And this all should and should be always bipartisan. And we have to keep remembering that this 100,000 isn't a number. Everyone's got a name. My nephew's name was Ian. They all have a brother. They all have sisters, moms and dads, friends and coworkers and neighbors. And 100,000 are gone. And we have no reason to think that number is gonna go the other way. There's nothing that says that's gonna improve because the fentanyl is now being cut into not just heroin, not just Coke, not just Oxy, but into Xanax and all types of other enhancers. Pill factories cut it in two, over 2.0 milligrams and you're probably dead. They don't measure very well, the cartel members. It's not their strength. So this work that we're doing here with Terry is so crucial. 
We have a bill called the State Opioid Response Grants. It's $10.6 billion over six years. It's already passed the House, and we're working to get it now through the Senate to prevent and treat those suffering. And we've got to get both sides of the aisle, and that's what Sylvie understands so well. We've got to have those Republican senators on board. Without their cooperation, you've seen what's happening now on appointments, ambassadors, judges, nothing is moving. It's at a standstill. So we've got to work as a team. And I think these are issues that we can do that. So I really have enjoyed trying to help folks in these two areas. It's a passion of my life, but I know we can't do it alone. We need a team. We have a team here in this room. We're building a team in Congress, and we need institutions like American University to literally work around the clock to find these cutting edge solutions to our community's greatest challenges. And we can create policies and think about the lives. If we could just reduce that 10, 20, 30,000, that's something to leave to your kids. We made a real difference, saved so many lives, the potential's there. So thank you for all you do. And uh, I'm delighted to be able to be here. And I just wish my wife could have been along and uh, we'll catch her next time. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Chong, uh, for joining us and for making this day possible. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Peter Starr, Provost of American University. Provost Starr joined AU in 2009 as my dean, uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, a position that he held for more than a decade. And from his time and experience in that role, he knows firsthand what Dr. Davidson's work means for the future of AU science. It is my pleasure to invite Provost Starr to the podium to begin the ceremonial portion of our celebration. Before I begin the ceremonial portion, I just want you to look out there. That's the past of science at American University. <laughs> this is the present and the future of science at American University. Thank you, Max. It's an honor to be here today to celebrate this milestone uh, for the American University community. AU's faculty are innovative, collaborative, and highly accomplished scholar teachers. As we look to the future, as Congressman Trone just said, scientific research is even more central to our mission as a country, as a nation, as a world. And as outlined in our Change Makers for a Changing World Strategic Plan and in our Priorities of Our Change Can't Wait campaign, we're working significantly to expand faculty support and to advance research that addresses society's most pressing problems. As part of that work, we're committed to recruiting and retaining the most talented, skilled, and committed researchers. And one critical way to do that is through endowed chairs. By allowing us to bestow this accolade on a faculty member like Terry Davidson, visionary donors like David and June Trone, create an enduring legacy and ensure that AU is the home to the most exceptional and engaged thought leaders and practitioners. So here comes my history lesson. Why do we refer to these as chairs? The roots of the term come from the medieval Catholic church. Teaching was said to take place ex cathedra from the chair because each member of the church hierarchy had a throne-like celebrant's chair in their church. Are you paying attention? <laughs> this chair was an outward symbol of authority, wisdom, and responsibility. Yeah, right? Checks all the boxes. The idea evolved to include communities of scholars, clerical scholars associated with large cathedrals, and then eventually evolved into academic chairs in institutions of higher learning. In line with the origins of the name, the practice of installing endowed faculty chairs also reflects customs dating back millennia. Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius created academic chairs of philosophy in the second century. And Lady Margaret Beaufort, the mother of Henry VII, established a named professorship at the University of Cambridge in 1502. In America, the first endowed professorship established at Harvard in 1721 antedates the formation of the United States. Chairs now signify the authoritative knowledge 
of outstanding modern scholar. Today, American University installs Dr. Terry Davidson as the Trone Family Eminent Scholar Chair. As Max said, Dr. Davidson received his PhD in experimental psychology from Purdue University and his BA in psychology from Michigan State. He completed postdoctoral training in behavioral neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania's Institute of Neurological Science. And his pathbreaking research includes studying the pathological changes in the hippocampus associated with the Western diet, what most of us eat, how these disruptive effects reduce a subject's ability to resist drug addiction. And, and this is really what, where Congressman Trone was, was going, is different treatments to protect the hippocampal blood-brain barrier from drug and diet-induced change. Dr. Davis's work is poised to revolutionize the way we understand and treat addiction and other cognitive disorders. As one of AU's most celebrated scholars, he demonstrates tireless dedication to exploring the science of the brain and to facilitating a collaborative approach to the practice of science. With this eminent scholar chair, AU is positioned not only to advance Dr. Davidson's groundbreaking addiction work, but also to leverage our great strengths in fostering partnerships and engaging in impactful scholarship to inform, uh, to better, to, excuse me, to inform better and more effective policymaking. Terry has been recognized with the American University Award for Outstanding Scholarship, Research, Creative Activity, and Other Professional Contributions, the single longest title in any American University <laughs> faculty award, which I always find I have to get to the end of, but Terry's won it. And also with the American University Award for Outstanding Contribution to the Fostering of Collaborative Scholarship, for which he was the inaugural winner. His collaborative work on addiction with AU colleague Tony Riley who is my partner in bringing Terry here, thank you, Tony, has been recognized in such prominent media outlets as NPR, Los Angeles Times, Scientific American, American Scientist, and Psychology Today. We are proud to call such a respected and distinguished researcher as Terry Davidson, RAU colleague, and an embodiment of our scholar-teacher ideal, where faculty engage students in their research and actively incorporate it into their teaching. His pioneering work attracts students at all levels who are eager to join him as he shapes the future of this important area of research and the world. Dean Friedman and Dr. Davis, will you please join me at the podium? Well, I've got more remarks. <laughs> you always need a Beth O'Brien to keep you on your toes. Terry, American University recognizes your outstanding contributions in research and teaching, honors your exemplary service to the field of neuroscience, and acknowledges the distinction you bring to the university by appointing you the Trone Family Eminent Scholar Chair in Neuroscience and Behavior established thanks to the generosity of David and June Trone through the Trone Family Foundation. With this chair, American University bestows upon you one of its highest faculty honors and recognizes your contributions as a world-class scholar and educator. Congressman Trone, this medal, which we present to you, a companion to the one bestowed on Dr. Davidson, signifies your enduring legacy and commitment to the, through the creation of the Trone Family Eminent Scholar Chair in Neuroscience and Behavior. American University is grateful for your philanthropic leadership and vision, which ensures the highest levels of academic scholarship in perpetuity. Thank you. It's a tradition at these. Applause. 
Is it a tradition at these ceremonies for the newly installed professor to deliver an inaugural lecture in this new role? I'm now pleased to invite Dr. Davidson to deliver his first lecture as the inaugural Trun Family Eminent Scholar Chair. Well, um, as a scientist, uh, this kind of recognition is not something we get every day. And, uh, uh, and so it's a little bit overwhelming. Uh, but one thing I think I have to do to put things in perspective, I have two things to say. One is uh, look around the building, uh, this room. Uh, we have a brand new, uh, less than two years old, a Department of Neuroscience. We have a university-wide uh, center for neuroscience and behavior. Um, and this was not brought up about by me. Uh, I, I should recommend or at least uh, acknowledge uh, previous provost Scott Bass was the person who started this. Peter was a uh, dean at that time, and he's continued as, as uh, provost to support the sciences, uh, along with President Burwell. Uh, Courtney uh, has been helpful as well. Uh, we've had, and, and I should I should mention uh, Dean Friedman, who's continued in the tradition of, as a dean of a College of Arts and Sciences. So um, I, I want to recognize those folks. Uh, the, the other thing I want to do is, uh, to put things in perspective is um, I'm going to tell you a story. And the story, it's a true story. Um, when I was in the ninth grade, I was uh, uh, chosen to be on a uh, basically a science quiz team. And so it was a team, I'm from a small community. We had 2,600 people, farm community. And we were going on television to compete against other schools. And the school that we had to compete against first was a place, uh, was called Midland Dow High School. This was in Michigan. Dow Chemical, this is where uh, Dow Chemical was located. And so we had a bunch of farm kids like me. I was raised on a 100 acre farm. And we we're going up against kids who are engineers, chemists, and those kinds of things. And I wish I could say this was a David and Goliath story, but they, they murdered us. They, they really <laughs> they, they creamed us. And uh, the, 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 but that's not the bad part, I guess. Um, so uh, I was, again, the ninth grade member, and um, I was asked just one question that I had to answer, right? And so I, wasn't, I didn't know what it was beforehand, but I had to answer this question. And the question was this, what is the stimulus found in coffee? And so I looked, proudly and with great confidence into the camera. And I said, the stimulus found in coffee is nicotine. <laughs> uh, so there's, there, there's, there, there's two things I want to say about that. Uh, one is I wish my uh, ninth grade science teacher could see me now. And the other is, um, so at that time, ninth grade, that was the biggest honor I had being selected for that team. And I was quite excited about it. And I have to say that today is also the biggest honor I've had so far. And I'm quite excited about it too. So I'm not exactly sure what's gonna happen here. We'll, we'll go <laughs> the best. So um, the, the, this, uh, this is the title of my talk. And uh, some people will recognize it as an older rock song. Uh, Courtney certainly will, <laughs> and Peter probably, <laughs> yes. Uh, so the basic idea here is that there's a bright future, and I want to talk a bit about that, uh, and I'm also going to talk about, well, actually, what I'm going to talk about is these things. There's, there's, there's a, a reason to be looking at the future brightly. As you know, we have uh, our campaign is called Change Can't Wait. I'm going to give you three reasons here why change can't wait, and then I'm going to talk about ways that we're going to have to, we'll, we'll try as scientists to uh, uh, cause this change. And then I want to talk about how the future of neuroscience is so bright here and why that is. Um, so why change can't wait? Here's one reason. These are the latest statistics on obesity from the uh, CDC. And as you um, may know, that we've had the highest obesity rates ever recorded. It's the last time they've taken, uh, they, they took a measure. This is the highest in obesity rates. As uh, Congressman Trone mentioned, we have the terrible statistic of overdoses. This is the highest level of overdoses that we've ever had. Uh, and uh, this doesn't, of course, cover all of the other uh, kinds of um, victimization and, and uh, pain that drugs have caused. 
And then um, this one is kind of worrisome. Um, this looks at uh, people diagnosed with dementia in the US, and this is a projection. And so what we're seeing here is about now, we've got about 6.1 million. If we go to about 30 years from now, it's gonna, over, it's gonna double. And the problem we have is, um, I guess the takeaway message from this is that science has so far failed uh, to address these serious threats. And uh, it's not that we have been trying. Scientists have been trying for a long time to address these specs. And so I think um, it's time maybe that new conceptualizations should be considered. And so let's uh, take a look at just a kind of conceptualization, this kind of cartoon model. So what this fellow is doing is he's spotted the golden arches, all right? And what that makes you think of when you spot the golden arches is hamburgers and french fries and things that have characterized what's called the Western diet, actually. Western diet is high in fats, saturated fats and, and, and sugars. And so if he's hungry, what this means is, is that most likely he's gonna think about that food and think, well, it's gonna make me feel good. It's gonna be really rewarding, right? Um, what happens then? So during hunger, these food related cues are going to retrieve a memory of this rewarding event. And when you think about food, right? That's what we're talking about, retrieving a memory. You can have thoughts about it. You're much more likely to respond to cues in the environment that tell you uh, that, that, that food's available. That you're more likely to eat. Um, typically, though, what we would hope would happen is that when you have these uh, golden arch moments um, and you're sated, your food's tidy, what you expect is that now you might think of the food, but you're not going to think that's all that rewarding because you're sated. And so the signal of the satiation tells you uh, what to anticipate uh, when you eat that food. Where things go wrong is this fellow, and you notice he's a little stouter than the last ones. Right, uh, things go wrong, runs into the golden arches again. He has this um, memory of food and that brings back this reward. The problem is, you know, we don't get overweight. We don't engage in behavioral excess uh, because we're hungry, right? We do it, we gain the weight because we eat when we're not hungry. And so what happens is, is that now this food satiety is not doing its job anymore. And so we still have this reward that's associated with those things and we're not pushing that reward down, we're not inhibiting it. So I wanna talk a little bit about now the extension of this model. So we kind of started with this particular model and we've done a lot of work trying to understand how the brain works. And now we've extended the model and try to understand how the brain works with respect to uh, the drug addiction. And we'll talk, instead of hunger, we'll talk about craving. Okay, and so when we have craving, you would run into a drug trigger. So I used the example of golden arches before, but there are lots of different drug triggers for people who are, uh, um, tend to use these drugs and get addicted to them. Well, one of the things that will make you think of the drug, and quite often when a person uses the drug, it'll be a rewarding effect, and when they're craving, they'll think when they're craving that the, rejoin, the drug will be rewarding. Um, what typically you expect to happen, now you might not know this, but even drug intake is regulated. It's regulated like, uh, kind of like food intake. And that is that even a person who uses drugs usually don't take enough drugs well that where, where they're gonna harm themselves, except when this regulation stops working. So typically what you would have then is a person who has drug triggered, but uh, they're, they have drug satiety. And when that happens, they don't think of the reward. It's time, not, it's time to stop using that drug. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have a situation where these drug triggers, and this occurs in real drug abuse and, and, and a drug addiction, those drug uh, triggers, um, well, you still think of the drug, uh, you think of the reward, but now that satiety mechanism is not working there either, which then means that you're gonna take more of the drug than you might. It's gonna become dysregulated in the same way that appetite might become dysregulated, right? So the question is, I think, um, what produces these failures of satiety? in both obesity and drug addiction. What produces that problem? And so I'm gonna give you a few fundamentals first so I can get to the answer, uh, at least the answer I think is the case uh, to these questions. One, uh, uh, what you're looking at here is a human brain. It's a, it's, a, it's a cross section. So it's kind of like if this person was here, they'd be looking at you. And uh, what you're seeing is a normal brain with no pathology. And that's uh, what you're looking at on the left here. Uh, and I'm pointing out, uh, especially this, uh, hippocampus, this area there, um, that's a very important area for learning and memory. And it's one I've been studying for many years. 
So we compare that to a brain that has advanced Alzheimer's disease. And so one of the things you can see is that brain is smaller and that's because you're getting atrophy in this disease. It's also the case that if you look at those little um, dark spots, those are ventricles in the brain, they're large, that's also part of atrophy. The thing that seems to be most important, at least the kind of work we're doing, is um, this hippocampal damage. You notice the hippocampus in this disease is almost gone. Right? Okay, so one of the things that happens with Alzheimer's disease, one of the things we found is that Western diets and addictive drugs also have that, that they're a target. In other words, they target the hippocampus uh, as, uh, as a, 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 for pathophysiology, for damage. They hit those areas first and they hit them hardest. Now, I wanna give you a little bit more fundamental. So keep in mind what the hippocampus does. It's, it's a very important area in memory. Um, the brain looks like this if you looked at all of the blood vessels. So there are miles and miles of blood vessels in the brain. So it's highly vascularized and the brain uses up a lot of energy, needs a lot of nutrients, it needs oxygen, and these blood vessels supply that to, to, the, to the brain, including the hippocampus. Uh, this is the inside of a blood vessel. And in this blood vessel, this, what the blood brain barrier does, that's, that's the barrier between the blood and the tissue. What it does, it prevents uh, entry of bad things, pathogens, um, also uh, will regulate entry of nutrients. So you can't have too much of a good thing that has to be regulated. And I, one of the things that happens, I, I think I want you to point out, it says uh, at the bottom here, tight junction proteins. Those are the things that basically um, what will happen in, in uh, this case is that your blood brain barrier is kind of like this and it's held together by these tight junction proteins. And what will happen is they'll spread out when, when you have something that will, um, how should I say, like a diet or Alzheimer's disease or other kinds of diseases, they pack these kinds of uh, tight junction proteins and they spread and that allows uh, things to get in to the brain from the bloodstream uh, that normally wouldn't get in. All right. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I wanna show you is that when we increase uh, hippocampal permeability, we're gonna get problems with cognitive function, particularly late life. So I mentioned three problems. I mentioned obesity, I mentioned uh, addiction, and I mentioned dementia. And this is what happens in, in uh, dementia. So what you're looking at here says NCI, that's no cognitive impairment in a young person. So people, young folks, uh, their, their hippocampus is intact pretty much. And you can tell that, you can look at their blood brain barrier. There's techniques now that you can look to see how much permeability, how much stuff is getting in that shouldn't get in. It's blue like this, this means it's functioning really well. All right, when we get a little older, now these are non-cognitive impaired older folks, okay? And this, that little square shows where the hippocampus is. If we focused in on that square, what we would see is, well, it's not quite as blue. There's a little bit of uh, permeability coming in. Things are getting in that shouldn't get in. And then what we have is mild cognitive impairment. And so as we get older, so first off, as we get older, our cognitive function, it's not that we're, you know, uh, we, we lose a lot, but it's, it's almost any other kind of function we have is going to be impaired a little bit. It might be these changes in blood barrier, barrier that produce that. When you actually start having a disease state, a mild cognitive impairment would be that state. You start seeing more uh, blood brain barrier permeability. And then in the, the worst case, uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, what you can see is not only do you have a lot of permeability, the hippocampus is no longer really protected very well by the blood brain barrier, but it's also, there's atrophy there. You notice it's smaller, all right? So it looks like the blood brain barrier is an important thing in terms of cognitive function. Typically, the worse the blood brain barrier is, the worse your cognitive function is. Better, better uh, blood brain barrier, better cognitive function. And in these cases, uh, this seems to be borne out in terms of comparing cognitive function of a, a person who has various stages of uh, uh, blood brain barrier permeability. Okay, um, now what we've done is we've looked at permeability in Western diet. And I wanna show you a comparison between Western diet. So this is high fat, this thing that produces obesity and also an addictive drug, in this case, cocaine. And I, I have to uh, point out, and it was mentioned by Peter, and it certainly is the case, that the, the cocaine side of this, the drug addiction side, is uh, uh, my colleague, Tony Riley, sitting way back up there, 
is uh, one of the people who has been most instrumental in helping me get this uh, 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 study this particular effect. All right, so what you're looking at here is we're measuring blood brain barrier permeability in a rat. Well, we're looking at rats. And so you can see the hippocampus. The blood brain barrier permeability in the dark bar with the Western diet is way higher than uh, with a controlled diet, which is not high fat and high sugar. Um, the striatum is another area of the brain, which is not the hippocampus. It looks like the hippocampus is really selectively sensitive to these kinds of diets. And so other part of the brain, other parts of the brain are not affected as much. Now, here's a similar experiment. We're looking at blood brain barrier permeability, but now we're looking at cocaine injections. And so these are rats that were given cocaine. And one of the things you can see is pretty much the same kind of effect. And that is that the hippocampus becomes really permeable. And this was 20 injections of a, of a drug over 20 consecutive days. And again, striatum showed almost no effect. So the hippocampus was particularly vulnerable to the drug effect and particularly vulnerable to the, to the diet effect. Um, and so I think uh, the next thing I wanted to show you was cognitive function. So here we have, uh, we measure the ability of animals to solve a problem that depends upon the hippocampus. Hippocampus, uh, there's some problems you can solve, you don't need that part of the brain. Other problems you can't solve without the hippocampus being intact or functioning properly. And so here's a problem that, that the uh, hippocampus is needed for in these rats. And what you can see that if we compare, this is light tone thing, what this means is, is that you have a tone, uh, you put it on, the problem is you put a tone, it gets reinforced, and then you put on a light and it tells the animal not to respond. And that's kind of important because that's what we think satiety cues do. They tell animals to anticipate not getting as much reward. And what you can see is animals in a control diet solve that problem really well but animals on a Western diet do not. Now we looked at cocaine as well. And with respect to cocaine, uh, what we found was a similar uh, problem. It's not as quite as big, but again, this was a, a, a fairly low dosage, a fairly low amount of exposure. But what you can see is still a significant difference. So we produce an impairment in this, the function of this structure in uh, these animals. So um, one thing I think is maybe very interesting and so what we asked was, um, if Western diet interferes with the same area of the brain and, and, and interferes with behavioral ambition, that is the ability to stop using the diet, ability to stop using the drug, then we thought, well, if we maintain rats on Western diet, would that make the effects of cocaine stronger? Would that make it more difficult for the animal to refrain from responding to cocaine? And this uh, was done with uh, my students and Tony's students and, and, and what happened was, is we trained these animals to press a bar to get cocaine infused into their vein. And so they would press the bar and they learned to do this very well. They, you, cocaine was rewarded to those rats. But after we trained them to do that, we gave them Western diet for about 60 days. Let them eat the Western diet. And then we put them back in there to see what would happen to the responding after they had that diet. Uh, so what you're looking at here what this basically shows you is the animals that were on the Western diet responded way more, right, when they were poor cocaine than the animals were given normal chow. And this shows the same thing. They made, we asked how many responses would these animals make to get one cocaine reinforcement? And they averaged about 118 responses to get one cocaine reinforcement, whereas uh, these chow fed rats uh, basically pressed 15 times before they would quit. So it really impacted. Right, so the diet, and, and this made sense to us because we think cocaine and the diet are da da uh, damaging the same areas of the brain. All right, so here's where we're at with this. This is a model, and I have to tell you, I've skipped about 25 years worth of research here. <laughs> okay. So um, here's, we, we call it the vicious model of, uh, vicious cycle model of, of uh, obesity and cognitive decline. And uh, so basically it starts with Western diet intake. And what we think happens with this Western diet intake is we disrupt the function of the BBB and we uh, make the hippocampus not do its job very well. What that means is, is that animals and people can't inhibit, right? Uh, the memory of food rewards. So remember uh, that to inhibit food rewards, society signals should do that. These guys are impaired in doing that. And that means that cues in their environment that are associated with food are going to be more powerful. If you're thinking about food, it's going to be more powerful, those cues in the environment and listening, eating responses. 
in, in terms of anticipation of this reward. And what will happen then is that eating Western diet becomes excessive Western diet. And if you start eating more of the Western diet, you get this more BVD disruption, more hippocampal dysfunction, and so on. The same thing we think happens, so we'll get obesity and cognitive decline. The same thing we think happens, and this is work again that, uh, that I've done with Tony, and um, this is a vicious cycle model of addiction and cognitive decline. And so drug intake leads to the same kind of BB dysfunction and, and, and disruption and BB uh, hippocampal dysfunctions. And the same thing happens, uh, we get impaired inhibition of these drug reward memories, which makes it more difficult to ignore responding to cues in the environment, those targets, uh, those triggers, and that's gonna produce excessive drug intake, so uncontrolled intake. Now, if you think about it, what happens then is that the cycle gets repeated. And what can happen is as it gets repeated, the damage to the hippocampus gets worse and worse. And as the damage to the hippocampus gets worse and worse, the tendency to engage in these behaviors gets worse, but not only that, cognitive function. Keep in mind the hippocampus is very important for cognitive function. And so the cognitive function is gonna get more and more impaired. So I do wanna recognize my lab, three of them are sitting back up, up there. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit uh, uh, about what we plan on doing next. Uh, that's me on the, on the far uh, left. And uh, Olivia is, uh, I called today, our, our all-star student. Uh, she is uh, doing some great stuff. She is helping us come up with ways to try to stop this. Um, what was that? <laughs> There we go. <laughs> All right, to, to try to prevent this cycle, try to break this cycle. Um, and uh, Grace is a brand new student. I have a lot of, of, uh, of hope for her uh, as it, Anish and, and Jordan. Alexia is the backbone of our lab. She's a, our main technician. Wambura, there she is over there. She's a postdoc in the lab and she's been very helpful with respect to just working out the conceptual things and talking and giving us a kind of, of sounding board for some of our ideas. One thing great about Wambura, uh, I'm going to say it sounds bad, Ron, but you're leaving. Uh, but she's leaving because she's getting job offers to interviews all over the place, which is very, very, very good. Uh, congratulations, Ron. Okay, so what we're, our, our goal is, right, is right now we want to identify processes. And I told you about those tight junction proteins that tend to they, they get weakened. We want to identify processes that damage those proteins. And in this hippocampal blood-brain barrier. And then once we identify those processes, uh, we want to determine, we don't know yet, if they're activated by Western diet. We do have some evidence that they're activated by drugs, okay? And then uh, the next thing is to discover interventions. How can we prevent this activation? Because if we can protect the hippocampus according to these ideas we have from this blood-brain barrier breakdown, then what we get is um, uh, most likely, you won't see that cycle reiterated and they'll be less likely for people to uh, overuse drugs and overuse food. And so our goal is to break that vicious cycle. All right, I just wanna talk a little bit about the futures, right? One thing about, I, I wanna say, and I'll move through this fairly quickly, um, our vicious cycle models have an impact. And so I won't go through all of these, but when we look at these, these are all recent, one fact this review hasn't come out yet, I just saw a preprint of it. And it's about the relationship between um, uh, uh, eating, memory, and obesity. And they talk about our model as being a, a, building, uh, a building block for other uh, data, for studies with uh, hormones and how those hormones can impact uh, satiety signals. Uh, if we move down, we'll see another review article from uh, aging uh, research reviews, and that's Western diet is a trigger uh, for uh, Alzheimer's disease. And they talk about our model and how our models describes how that uh, trigger might work. And then um, the last one is uh, looking at palatable diets on vulnerability to addiction. And it's also another review, this is current uh, uh, pharmaceutical designs, another review that cites our model as a mechanism for how this addiction could occur. Um, the last thing in terms of the future is bright is I do want to mention this back row. And quite often, it, especially meetings where we have a, a distinguished mixed audience, not a meeting of scientists, what you'll find is the scientists are sitting in the back row. I'd probably be back there myself if, if it wasn't you know, one of the other. So I, I, I want to tell you that I, I'm, I'm, I'm so proud to be a part of this group. And one of the reasons I'm so proud, each one of them in their own way, uh, Lori is our newest member. And uh, we made a decision. We had a chance to hire someone from just open national search. 
And we thought she was in the psychology department, but we thought she was better than anybody we could get in the natural search. So we asked her to join our department. Um, Kathleen Holton, who's also in the Department of Health Studies, uh, she's been ex done exceptional work in terms of, she's funded by the Department of Defense. She looks at Gulf War syndrome. She's looking at dietary intervention. She's a nutritional neuroscientist. Mark Laubach is a, um, Mark Laubach knows everything, uh, right? <laughs> There's really about nothing you could say that he doesn't know about. But he's also a great scientist. He studies the decision processes in the brain. And he's also a leader of a kind of uh, international project that's going to advance not only methodology, uh, access to equipment, but concepts in uh, neuroscience. Um, Tony Riley, I mentioned, he's been my collaborator and he's been a colleague of mine since I got here. He was one of the people uh, that made me want to come here. Uh, he's got over 200 publications and he's worldwide known. Uh, Colin, Colin is a behavioral endocrinologist. Colin, uh, show of how, what kind of impact Colin has. He was tapped by the National Science Foundation just a couple of years ago to lead a program in behavioral endocrinology, actually a program in biological science and systems that, uh, uh, I mean, they don't just tap anybody for those jobs, right? They tapped him because of his expertise and knowledge. Uh, Catherine Studley, uh, she is outstanding. I'll say one thing about Catherine. She publishes, uh, people recognize her work. She's very, uh, as you can see, she's um, one of our younger members, uh, yet nonetheless, she has a, a been really recognized well. Uh, Catherine had a, um, she had her work on the cover of what's called Nature Neuroscience. Getting your work on the cover of Nature Neuroscience to the rest of us would be like getting our faces on the cover of Time Magazine, right? <laughs> That's, that is a really kind of a, a special honor. And then there's me and I'm the, uh, the Trone family uh, eminent scholar chair <laughs> in neuroscience and behavior. One thing, so. <laughs> So you might think this is just so much talk, right? I'm trying to build. I want you to look at this statistic. So one of the things that, that we've tried to establish as part of the strategic plan was uh, this zone of distinction. And it was established, our department was established in 2020. Um, this group of folks, these seven folks you see here, uh, they've, their publications, their papers have been cited over 35,000 times, just these seven, right? <laughs> And this is by international and national so, uh, You can see why it is I'm so proud to be associated with this group. And um, the last, oh, I almost forgot. Someone has to make the trains run on time. And that's Bernadette who, who does, she does undergraduates, uh, she does our, our graduate students, make sure that everything runs on time. All, if you have a really productive faculty too, that produces a lot of work for our senior administrative assistant and she does it excellently. And so I, I, I would have, if I had, had not mentioned really that. Okay, the very last thing I want to talk about is the Center for Behavioral Neuroscience. What you're seeing here is different levels of analysis. And this is what we do at the center. One of the things we could use uh, that we're lacking right now is somebody at the molecular level. Maybe we'll fix that. But the top thing is very unusual. And that is informed policy and societal change. This is not usually a part of science, but it, I think it's the final step, the most important final step. In other words, we have to convince people like a Congressman Trone and others that these are important ideas that deserve to be put into practice. They deserve to be promoted by the policymakers. So what we've done, we've now just established what's called the Neuroscience Policy and Law Initiative. And I, I won't have time to go through all these folks, but what you're seeing here is we have folks from uh, Washington College of Law. We have uh, folks from uh, uh, the CAS. We have folks from uh, the School of Public Affairs. And all of these folks are working together to try to um, basically make it so policymakers can produce sound policy based on sound science. And we have to be able to learn how to talk to each other. What is the, the there's cultural differences, language differences, modes of action differences. And what we wanna know is how do we bridge those gaps? And so we're working at that. One of the things that maybe you'll listen to later on is our Lobes and Robes uh, podcast series, which we're just putting together now. And basically, I want to give a special shout out to Susan Carl. Susan Carl is a dynamo. 
uh, and she's from the law school. She's been uh, pushing this uh, and helping me with this whole thing. Uh, it's really, I shouldn't say helping me, she's really driving it. I wouldn't be surprised I have messages now saying, you better review this and edit that. Uh, and, and then I just want to give thanks to Che Rao from uh, Vicki Wilkins uh, uh, Department of our School of Public Affairs. He's been our technical person. And the last thing I want to mention is we're trying to get a, a, a master's degree policy in law. And that's a proposed policy now where we actually begin training students on the integration of these kinds of ideas. Finally, I got to wear uh, sunglasses. We got a fantastic new building, <laughs> right? Uh, and it's great for research and training. And so I want to thank the Abramson family uh, for your contributions to the Hall of Science. And obviously you made other contributions to AU as well. But thank you very much for this. And of course, uh, having a new building, we also need the means to support research in the highest quality. And now with the Trone family, uh, uh, endowed chair for a, neuro, or a scholar, and scholar chair in neuroscience behavior. Uh, we have this highest quality uh, research. We can fund it in perpetuity, which is quite, quite a um, thing. So I, I just wanna say that I began this talk with a warning and it was based on a, a event in my past history that um, I might make some gaps in the presentation today. Um, however, uh, there is one thing that I want to make, um, I want to absolutely get right. And that is uh, Congressman uh, Trump and your family. Um, I thank you for your generosity and uh, for your foresight in supporting the continued development of neuroscience and by extension, all sciences at American University. And I will do all I can uh, to honor your contribution and uh, your name as the inaugural uh, eminent scholar Chair in Neuroscience and Behavior at American University. Wow, well, congratulations, Terry, Dr. Davidson, and thank you. The strength and unique quality of your research and teaching so vividly in evidence in the presentation that we all just enjoyed uh, are a source of ongoing pride for the College of Arts and Sciences and AU. We all look forward to your continued work um, as the Trone family eminent scholar chair. Congressman Trone, thank you for your leadership and for your continued commitment to American University and to the College of Arts and Sciences. Your generosity ensures that the work done here is significant, thought-provoking, and of the highest caliber. As we conclude this ceremony, I invite you all to proceed upstairs to the collaboration room for a reception. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>